What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So by popular demand, I'm going to come back today and revisit a really good friend of mine. And I'm talking of course about Julia. A while ago, I did a video on the top 10 R packages you should learn in 2020, and I really stressed that it works like a Pareto sort of principle. That is, about 20% or even less than that of all the packages that are out there in the R ecosystem should get you 80% or more of the results that you need to do data science work. Well, I got some comments asking me how to get into Julia, so I thought, you know what? The same exact principle applies here. Obviously, Julia is a general purpose programming language, and there are tons of people who use it who have all kinds of different interests. I'm mainly targeting people here who are brand new to Julia, and their interest is in data science, meaning their primary interests are in things like wrangling and manipulating your data, making easy to use, powerful, clean looking graphs, creating models, whether they're of the statistical or machine learning or deep learning variety, and then possibly creating reports. Julia is fantastic for a lot of other things like mathematical optimization, for example, but quite frankly, a lot of those things are not my area of expertise. And if things like that are your interest, a number of these packages are still going to be very useful, but you're probably going to need to supplement them with some others. So I'm going to go over 10 Julia packages that will help you conquer the data science world from beginning to end. And they're all relatively popular packages, meaning they're all pretty likely to have pretty helpful user communities, as well as to be around for a while and to hopefully remain in development and continue being improved over time. Just as a disclaimer, all of this information is as of the time I'm recording this video, which is June 2020. Keep in mind that Julia does have pretty rapid package development. There are tons of packages you may see floating around out there which are now discontinued. And who knows, some of these in the coming months or years may be discontinued in the future too, but they're all super helpful today. As another point, this is just intended to give overview of these packages, and every single one of these packages could get their own video or even multiple videos on them. If you guys are interested in seeing follow-up tutorials on these packages, let me know in the comments and we'll see what we can do. So without further ado, we're going to start this list off with a simple one, and that's iJulia. This is a package which will enable your use of Jupyter Notebooks. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Jupyter is basically an environment where you can create documents which contain everything in one location. Your code, your comments, your visualization, all of that. And on top of that, you can output these documents as HTMLs, MDs, PDFs, or a bunch of different other formats. And this is the preferred environment that a lot of people in Julia and Python like to do all of their analysis in. It's not always my personal preference, but sometimes if I know that I'm going to be creating a report eventually anyway, sometimes it's easier to do all my work inside of Jupyter because it just keeps my entire workflow in one single environment. So here's the iJulia documentation, and as soon as you start Julia, you'll want to import the PKG package. That's just Julia's package management system, it's quite straightforward, and there's really only a few key functions you'll need to use out of that. But you do that, you run pkg.add iJulia, and you get iJulia added. Now at that point, you can run the function at the bottom here, which is notebook, and then it'll take you through the installation of Conda and the Python and Jupyter distribution, assuming you haven't already installed those things. After that point, you're good to go. You can use Jupyter Notebooks all the time if that's your working environment of choice, or just generally use it every now and then when you need the benefits that Jupyter has to offer. And there's more options that the iJulia package provides, like installing other Julia kernels. In particular, there's one really helpful one that gets rid of dependency warnings whenever you run a chunk of Jupyter code, so that's a pretty nice one. Also, iJulia is compatible with Jupyter Lab if you prefer that over the straight Jupyter Notebooks. Now that you're all set up with your environment of choice, moving on to number two, we have data frames. So this package is Julia's answer to pandas over in Python, and the closest analog in R is probably a combination of the deployR and tidyR packages. 
This package is going to give us our core data frame objects, and it also has tons of other super useful functionalities like selecting columns, filtering rows, sorting your data sets, creating new transformations of variables, joins, reshaping your data from long to wide or vice versa, all that good stuff. You've got the data frames type, which is the object type a lot of your data sets are going to be in, at least initially. And you can see from the example up top that you can create a data frame manually, or alternatively, you can use the CSV package and you can read in CSVs. And there's similar functionality if you use SAS data sets or anything else. Here again in this first example, you see the select function up top, which you can use for dropping columns. And obviously you have similar methods for filtering rows, sorting your data frame, creating new variables, all that jazz. Then if you look down below, you can see the super helpful describe function, which will return things like the mean, min, median, max, number of unique values, number of missing values, and data type. You've also got any SQL user's favorite thing in the world, which is joins. Now, as you can see here, you've got inner, left, right, outer, anti-joins, etc., etc. And then I'm not going to go through all of these here because I could easily spend a whole video on the data frames package. But if you look at the contents on the left, you've got functions that are inspired by Hadley Wickham's split apply combine approach in this package, as well as some functions for reshaping data that is going from wide to long format or vice versa. So obviously data frames is gonna be an absolute must know for any data scientist that's picking up Julia. Now moving on to number three, we have plots. Now this is a super basic, simple, easy to use visualization package for Julia. It's pretty popular, clocking in at 1,020 people starring it on GitHub at the time that I'm recording this video, and it's not my favorite overall Julia visualization package, but it does have some pretty useful features, which you'll see in a minute here. Basically the way to think of it is, it's an interpreter for various other visualization libraries. So as a simplest possible example, we have a line plot where some x and y are defined. And by default, if you make a graph like this, plots will assume you're making a line plot. More on that in a second. But here's the cool thing. Like I mentioned earlier, plots supports various different backends, aka different background plotting libraries. Now one that a lot of people are familiar with in the data science world is Plotly. So in this example, you can set the backend to Plotly before calling the plot function. And then when you create the plot, you have that interactive quality that you get from Plotly where you can drag your cursor over the graph and get more exact information. Plot is obviously customizable. And in the tutorial, you can find things like layouts, colors. Then under attributes, you can find objects that you can create, the various arguments you can pass to plots, a lot of good stuff like that. Now, one thing that is worth understanding in this documentation is the concept of recipes. Now, these aren't anything too crazy, just extensions of the plots framework, but they do enable plots to perform different plot commands, use different functions, and handle different data types. So in particular, one package you want to add with helpful recipes is called stats plots. It has some separate documentation, which I'll also link to in the description of this video, but it is a perfect complement adding more functionality to plots. Now number four is another visualization package, and that's the lesser known Vega Light. So remember a minute ago under plots when I mentioned that wasn't my favorite visualization package of Julia? Well, that distinction goes to Vega Light. Those of you who are more familiar with Julia may notice there's one visualization package that's pretty popular and I haven't talked about, and that's Gadfly. Well, I happen to like Vega Lite more than Gadfly. I think Vega Lite has a bit more of a higher learning curve, but ultimately at this time, I do think it's more flexible and more powerful. Here's an example of Vega Lite at work. So the key functionality here is the Julia macro at VLplot. And now in the tutorial, they import a data set from the package Vega datasets, but you can obviously use a data frame just like we saw earlier to kick off this process too. Now the VLplot function has a grammar of graphics framework. 
meaning our core components here are data, objects, and a mapping system. And then optionally, we can include whatever scales or transforms or aesthetic features that we need. In the very first line of this function, they specify the object to create is bars. And the next few lines, they use the transform argument to perform some changes to the data that have already been passed to the function. That's obviously optional. Then next, they specify to separate genders by row, put the sum of a variable called people on the y-axis, call that population. Then on the x-axis, there's the label age and then colors are specified with the hex code. Then you've got a visualization that looks pretty nice. Looks just like something you might create in R with the ggplot2 function using the facet wrap function inside of that. Speaking of R, at number five we have R call. Now for me it was pretty tough picking which one of R call or Pi call that I wanted to put on this list. One obviously helps you run R code from Julia, the other Python code from Julia, but I went with R because it's made for statisticians, whereas both Julia and Python are all around general purpose programming languages. My list, my rules, right? So here's how you get started with R call. You add R call just like you would any other package, but you also need to set up your environment variables to point to your local installation of R. And the tutorial is very nice at walking through how to do that if you're unfamiliar. Now, if you don't do this, R call will probably get confused and not work. Once you start using it, the ability to write R code is super easy and powerful. You can do this either from the Juno REPL or from Jupyter directly, but here's some examples. The user uses the macro R followed by quotes in order to create what's called R objects. See the example up top where they use the classic R norm function to sample from a standard normal distribution. But then in the next example, they create a standard Julia array and then pass that using the dollar sign symbol into R code in order to run R's t-test function. So R and Julia work together smoothly and effortlessly. Now that we've talked about R a little bit on that last one, moving on to number six, we have distributions. This is gonna give us all the functionalities of statistical distributions. Now, if you're doing any kind of simulation work or you work in applied stats or biostats type work, these are gonna be absolutely critical. So up top here in the documentation, we've got setting the seed, that's for reproducibility purposes. Then we've got the creation of a normal distribution object. Only two arguments to that, you've got your standard mu and sigma. Then that object is sampled from using the rand function and stored in a 100 element array called x. Now you can do whatever you need with that and distributions supports a ton of different statistical distributions. Binomial, exponential, uniform, gamma are some of the ones I've used the most in applied statistics work off the top of my head, but there's tons of others that are supported. Sometimes, too, you need to find the best fitting theoretical distribution given an empirical distribution of data as well. So that array created earlier called X is fitted to a best fitting theoretical distribution here, and it comes in close to the true values. From that little sample, we've got a mean of 0.04 and a standard deviation of 1.12. Cool stuff, again, critically important if you wanna do simulations or any kind of biostats work. At number seven, we have pretty tables. Now for those of you who know R, think of the functionalities here as analogous to the ones you get from the NetR and Cable Extra packages in R. If you're gonna be making reports, or especially if you're gonna be publishing any kind of documentation or research involving tables, pretty tables is going to be your friend. Here's the quick start from the documentation. You can use the pretty table function and you've got nicely formatted tables. Now, if you're using notebooks, these are gonna look much better than just printing off the data frames as they are. And then these are incredibly customizable. You can make these with an HTML backend or a LaTeX backend, and you can change the alignment. You can set the table to print only rows satisfying particular conditions. Great stuff. At the end of the day, if you're doing reports or documentation, it is important to make things look good. Presentation does matter. And to that end, pretty tables will come in handy for you. 
Now for the rest of these, we're going to move on to more model-driven packages. And to kick those off, at number 8, we have the GLM package. And this is going to make all of your linear and logistic regression needs super easy. You've got yourself a basic linear regression here, set the seed for reproducibility purposes, as is good practice most of the time you do modeling efforts. And now in this example, we're using a continuous response called Y and a categorical predictor called X, which takes values one, two, three, or four. Now data frames can help you make the categorical vector data type, but obviously if you don't want to have your predictor be categorical, no need to do that. All you have to do is run an LM function, just like you would in R, and you've got your classic regression output. Now from the object that results, there are tons of methods you can use to extract results. You can get the coefficient estimates, their standard errors, R squared, the predicted values, whatever you need. Then there's your GLM function. For most people, all they'll need is the logit link, which provides a logistic regression. But you've still got a flexible function that can support other types of generalized linear models. After a while, you'll forget you're not programming in R. Next up at number 9, for those of you who are Python programmers, you're probably already familiar with the scikit-learn package and how awesome it is for all things machine learning related. Well, the Julia implementation of scikit-learn is just as awesome. Now for the most part, it's going to work extremely similarly to how it does in Python, but there are some differences, most notably the fact the Julia implementation includes its own new Julia-based methods. Here we go. So scikit-learn can support somewhere between 100 and 200 different models. And those can be supervised learning approaches like linear regression, SVMs, random forest, neural networks, or unsupervised learning approaches like clustering, PCA, etc. But then scikit-learn is also a one-stop shop for transforming your data, which is often the most important step of all. It's also flexible in the sense that it expects arrays similar to the way Python's implementation does, but Julia's version does have the capability to support data frames as well. So this is straightforward. We use the at sk import macro to pull in the logistic regression model. Then you can fit, passing in your design matrix and your response variable. And obviously scikit-learn has capabilities for cross-validation, tuning hyperparameters, and all of that good stuff out of the machine learning universe. Now I'm saving the most technically complex package of all for last. Those of you more familiar with Julia probably already know which one this is going to be, and it's Flux. Flux is a Julia package for all of your machine learning and deep learning needs, and it's quite popular clocking in at the Julia package with the most stargazers on GitHub, at least at the time I'm making this video. And I genuinely do think as deep learning picks up and more organizations start doing it, Julia is going to be a great platform for it, just because of its beautiful speed and syntactical benefits. This one is challenging even to give a brief overview for, just because there's so much going on to it. But here's just a brief teaser. For this one, you have a tremendous amount of flexibility with doing things like defining your loss function manually, as well as performing gradient descent, all of it using only a few lines of code. And this works nicely because Flux's key feature is taking gradients of other Julia code. For those of you less familiar, gradient means the derivative function. One thing I do recommend looking at for starters with Flux is what's called the Model Zoo, which is just a repository of various features of it. You've got convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, NLP models, lots of awesome stuff. Link for that will be in the description too. Alright, so you've seen 10 packages in Julia that are going to give you enormous power and tons of features to tackle real-world data science problems and deliver awesome reports or graphs or models. This is by no means a full comprehensive list of everything you could possibly need in data science using Julia, but the beauty of Julia is it is growing and the capabilities are expanding daily. You can already see though, with just a few packages, you can do tons and tons. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you would like to support my work, the most helpful thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, at least consider smashing the like button, and also let me know in the comments down below what your favorite Julia package is. Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.